What does a European particle accelerator, x-rays, a fossil dinosaur, and breathing all have to do with one another? Well, they were all the subjects, or at least part of the subjects, in a recent paper about Heterodontosaurus tuckeye. And to be entirely fair, Heterodontosaurus is the fossil dinosaur in question, and it was one of the Ornithischians. So in the same group as things like the Hadrosaurs, the Ceratopsians, and the Stegosaurs, for just a few. And the methods used, that is, the particle accelerator and the x-rays, may have actually helped us understand how certain dinosaurs were able to breathe. And that might seem like a stupid question, but there's actually a lot of different ways that different animals breathe. For example, humans, we have muscles all along our chest and including the diaphragm that help expand the lungs to bring air in. Other animals, such as frogs, have what's called buccal breathing. Essentially, they force air into the mouth and then force that into the lungs and then back out the same way. This is why if you actually look at frogs, you can see their throat always just bobbing a little bit so that they can continue to breathe. But the modern dinosaurs, that is the birds, have an entirely different method. Essentially, they have air sacs surrounding the lungs. And this means they can inflate those air sacs, push that air into the lungs, and then while that air is still there, reinflate the air sacs and then push that old air out with the air that's in the air sacs. So functionally, they always have fresh air in their lungs and they're also not expanding their lungs. They're expanding these air sacs, so the lungs don't actually move at all. Because it's really, really hard to find things like lungs in the fossil record, it's always been assumed that all dinosaurs had very bird-like lungs. But this new paper helps to show that that's not the case because the researchers were able to find gastralia, or belly ribs. These were found by using very, very high energy x-rays created by the European Particle Accelerator. So essentially a large donut shaped machine that was shooting particles around at incredible, incredible speeds, creating x-rays. And then those x-rays would essentially hit the rock and the data was collected and they were able to 3D image the entire fossil and find these gastralia still in the rock. Gastralia are normally small and not preserved or only very poorly preserved. But these ones were actually reasonably well preserved and they were also in a much different position than actually they were thought to have been in. And that's because they were still attached all the way to the back of the pelvis, which this is an ornithischian, meaning that essentially the entire pubis bone had shifted backwards to open up more gut space to try and help digest plants. So essentially this shift, most researchers had thought meant that the gastralia would have had to become entirely decoupled from the pelvis and essentially would have been floating more just with the ribs. However, this helps to show that the gastralia were still completely connected to the pubis while this was occurring. In addition, we can also see how the gastralia actually interacted with the other parts of the ribs and with the sternum. And these gastralia actually had a kind of weird shape because they were shaped kind of like a paddle, with the more paddle-like end attaching to the rest of the rib and the narrow handle end attaching to the sternum. This kind of unique morphology means that essentially these ribs could spread out from one another, at least a little bit. And that means that there's probably a lot of muscles that were interacting with these parts of the ribs and the lungs to essentially help expand them, meaning that Heterodontosaurus, rather than breathing more like the birds, probably breathe a lot more like you and I. However, that's not all that this paper suggests because we do actually have really solid evidence that the Gastralia do eventually disappear in some later Ornithischians, which means at some point they changed their method of breathing. Now, to be entirely clear, Heterodontosaurus probably didn't breathe exactly like humans. The muscles would have been probably different muscles and they weren't necessarily having the same kind of diaphragm that we have that essentially ties back in on itself so it can pull open the lungs from the bottom. Instead, they had a different muscle that would have done a similar thing, and that's probably what facilitated breathing in later Ornithischians. This muscle, called the puboperitoneal muscle, would have essentially connected the back end of the lungs to the frontmost part of the pelvic girdle, and then through that muscle contracting would have essentially pulled the lungs open, and then by releasing, forced them closed again. And this is kind of similar to the way our diaphragm essentially pulls our lungs open from the bottom. So it's a similar mechanism, although still slightly different because our diaphragm doesn't connect that far down. This means that at least some dinosaurs were doing some very different things. And actually, even just from the bones, we can start to understand some of the ways their soft anatomy would have actually interacted with their own bodies as they evolved. And essentially how different changes in their biology may have actually occurred. So this paper really helps us to understand how dinosaur biology changed over time, including especially how some of their soft tissues like lungs, which aren't really preserved in the fossil record, also changed through time. And all it took was a couple of particles going nearly the speed of light releasing x-rays for us to figure it out.